Rav Kook Selected Letters Chapter 2 The topic is Torah versus Other Religions The preface to Letter 12 This letter is to Rav Y.D. Wolofsky known as the Ridbuzz, a noted scholar author of an important commentary on the Jerusalem Talmud and an opponent of Rav Kook's ruling that allowed cultivation in Israel during the sabbatical year in the selections from the letter presented, Rav Cook discussed, sorry, discusses the source, of, the source of that special strength of Israel, which enables it to be called the chosen people. He says that there are two components, one inherent, one inherent and unconnected to the Torah, a gift to each Jew out of the Lord's love for the people's forefathers, and second, the person's freedom to choose obedience to the commandments of the Torah. The first is more powerful because it does not depend on deeds. The second is conditioned on will. The more a person lives by the commandments, however, his inner segula, that first inherent gift, will be revealed with greater power. In this way, a Jew's hidden nature will be revealed by his deeds. Letter 12 By the grace of God, the holy city of Jaffa may be built and established 24 Sivan 5673. It's the 29th of June, 1913. To my beloved friend, the true Gaon, glory of our generation, Rav Yaakov David Ridbaz, may he live to a long and good life. Amen. According, sorry, regarding your bewilderment over my befriending everyone, even the transgressors of Israel, the secularists, in order to return them to Judaism, I answered you already with a hint that whoever is capable of being engaged in the innerness of the secrets of the Torah, becomes more filled with a light from the Torah of loving kindness, and it is his obligation to be engaged in the restoration of the fallen and the bringing and the bringing near and the bringing near to God of those who are far, which is also generally called in the language of the Kabbalists the gathering of sparks of holiness from the shells. You have found this to contradict the prayer against apostates and slanderers. A footnote. This is a special blessing in the Shemun directed against Israel, Israel's external and mainly internal enemies, including the Minim, the Christians. Various cults which broke away from Judaism, including and in particular, in particular the early Jewish Christian, Christians. You have found this to contradict the prayer against apostates and slanderers in which we pray for their uprooting and destruction. Please take note of my words and I will and I will explain it to you. Not in the language of the secrets of Torah Kabbalah, of which you think that you already know, that you do not know. Uh, footnote. But he thinks that he has knowledge when he has not, while I, having no knowledge, do not think that I have. I seem at any rate to be a little wise than he is on this point. I do not think that I know what I do not know. This is a so from Socrates in Plato's Apology. Back to the text. Please take note of my words and I will explain it to you, not in the language of the secrets of the Torah Kabbalah, of which you think that you already know that you do not know, but in plain words. Indeed, these and these, are the and these are the words of the living God, as will be explained here. You should know that there are two main things that together build the holiness of Israel and the divine connection with them. The first is segula, a treasure. That is to say, the nature of the holiness that is in the soul of Israel as a legacy from our patriarchs. As the verse says, not for your righteousness. Footnote. Deuteronomy 9.5 The full verse reads Not for your righteousness or for the uprightness of your heart do you go to possess the land but on account of the weakness of these nations the Lord thy God does drive them out before you and that he may perform the word which the Lord swore to your fathers Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Only in thy forefathers did God find pleasure to love them and he chose their descendants after them. This is Deuteronomy 10.15 you shall be my Sugula, special treasure, from among all the peoples, Exodus 19.5. This Sugula is an inner holy power which God's, will, which God's will was to enlane the nature of the soul, and it, like the nature of everything existing, 
cannot be changed. For he spoke, and it was. From Psalms 33.9 He made them endure forever. Psalms 146.6 The second is the aspect of free will, which is dependent on good deeds and Torah study. The aspect of Sukkula is incomparably greater and holier than the aspect of free will. However, it is an everlasting covenant that in these times the inner Sukkula will be revealed only to the extent that free will facilitates its revelation and therefore everything depends on the multiplication of good deeds, the holiness of faith and the study of Torah. And the Lord blessed, be he, blessed he be, who in his loving kindness guides every generation, sets the constellation of souls that should appear in the world. Sometimes the power of free will becomes stronger, and the power of Sugula is hidden and is not distinct. And sometimes the power of Sugula becomes stronger and the power of free will is hidden. The whole essence of the covenant of the patriarchs, which does not cease even after the merit of the patriarchs has, it, has expired, stems from the power of Sugula. Uh, footnote, Rav Shmuel said that the merit of the patriarchs is exhausted, Tamar. See Shabbat 55a and Tosafot, which says in the name of Rabbi Tam that although the merits of the patriarchs were exhausted, the covenant of the patriarchs were not, was not exhausted. Citing the verse, Then will I remember my covenant with Jacob, and also my covenant with covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham will I remember, and I will remember the land. Leviticus 26.42 The whole essence of the covenant of the patriarchs, which does not cease even after the merit of the patriarchs has expired, stems from the power of Sugula, and in the approaching footsteps of the Messiah, the power of Sugula is greatly strengthened. This is the gist of the passage who remembers the good deeds of the fathers and who brings a redeemer to their children's children for his name's sake with love. From the first blessing of the prayer of Shmon Esri. Not by the aspect of free will, which is manifest in the good deeds of the children and in repentance, but for the sake of his name, that became that becomes revealed through the memory, through the memory of the good deeds of the patriarchs. Truly, at times the darkness becomes so strong that it stops the revelation of the Sukula as well. But this is possible only when someone reaches the point where he is, heaven forbid, a hater of Israel, who seeks and does evil to them, like the Minim, who, as Maimonides explains in the Laws of Prayer, used to, used, to, used to oppress Israel. Yet, even in this case, it was very difficult for the sages to formulate a special prayer against the Minim. Therefore, Rabban Gamliel asked, is there anyone worthy enough who knows how to formulate a benediction against the Minim? This is from Brachot 28b. And it was necessary that Shmuel the Lesser in particular formulate, formulate it, for he was free of any matter of hate, and was wont to say, Rejoice not when your enemy falls. From Avot 419. In order that the essence of the prayer would be directed only against those who have completely lost the Sugula. In our generation there are many souls who, although lowly with regard to the exercise of free choice, and therefore infected with many evil acts and very evil thoughts, may God protect us, are still lighted by the light of the Sugula, and therefore deeply love the community of Israel and have a passion for the land of, for the land of Israel, and their souls are distinguished by some good and precious qualities that stem from Israel's Sugula. If someone who does not have deep perceptive insight to know how to dis how to distinguish between the side of the holy Sugula quality in them and the side of malfunctioning free choice in them which surrounds the inner side as the briars and thorns surround the rose a footnote the Hebrew original reads makif et nafsham the allusion may be to the <coughs> excuse me the allusion may be to the Kabbalistic classification of the five parts of the soul Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama, Chaya, Yechida. Neshama is inner while Nefesh is not. So that the meaning could be that the aspect of free choice can ruin only the Nefesh and not the inner, inner Neshama. As the, uh, I'll go back to the beginning of the sentence. If someone who does not have deep perceptive insight to know how to, to how to distinguish between the side of the holy Sugula quality in them and the side of malfunctioning free choice in them, 
which surrounds the inner side, as the briars and thorns surround the rose, tries to befriend them, he, heaven forbid, may become corrupted, might learn from their deeds and become attached to the evil side in them. Such souls are obligated to distance themselves from them, and indeed God, blessed be he, puts in their hearts this will and this thought of hatred and alienation, in order that they not be swallowed. But one who is always occupied with inner contemplation, with the light of Torah, holiness and lofty fear of the exaltedness of the Master of all universes, the source of life, blessed be he, and not, heaven forbid, by the lowly fear alone, the fear of divine punishment in this world or in the world to come, which is an external fear in those Torah scholars who are occupied in an, in an inner understanding of the secrets of Torah, are forbidden to engage much in it, but are bidden to take only a little of it in order to discipline the body and its crude tendencies toward evil characteristics and, and contemptible attributes, heaven, heaven forbid. For in the main the heart should be filled with the sacred love, and a lofty awe from the secret of holiness, like the awe of the lofty angels, mighty ones who do his bidding, to heal him 103.20. These Torah scholars naturally recognize the quality of the inner sugula, and they know how to separate from it, through devout thought, the outer shell of free choice, and they are therefore obligated and duty-bound to befriend those transgressors who have the inner sugula in order to awaken more and more the power of good, hid, of good hidden within them, until it is until it totally overcomes and subdues the evil that they have chosen. The activity of these Torah scholars, savers of souls, is never in vain. Sometimes the results are clear, and those whom they befriend reform their actions cor and correct their opinions significantly and sometimes only an inner seed penetrates into them, and they are thus assured that they will not pass from this world without returning people to Judaism. And even if the person affected, heaven forbid, is so inferior that he himself does not merit repentance, yet the power of this seed will affect the nature of his soul, and it will raise virtuous children who will repent, and this will also mend the father's soul, as is the law of the merits of the Son, aid the Father, from Sanhedrin 104a. And the Lord, blessed be, he know, blessed be he, knows that I do not befriend all transgressors, but only those that I feel have a great power of sugula within them. There are many ways to attain this knowledge, and many lengthy books need to be written in order to explain just a little of this great thing, and of those who have already totally lost even their inner sugula. King David, may he rest in peace, said, Do I not hate, O Lord, those who hate thee? From Tehillim 139.21 And the sages pass down to us general signs for this. In most cases, the Minim and heretics have lost even their inner sugula, and this is what happens in most generations. But the, gen <coughs> but the generation of the approaching footsteps of the Messiah is an exception to this rule, for they are, as in the words of the Tikkun Zohar, Good on the good on the inside and bad on the outside, for they are the donkey of Messiah. From Tikkun 60, about which the verse says, "Behold, the King Messiah comes to you, lowly and riding on a donkey." And the meaning is like a donkey who has two external marks of impurity. See letter seven, footnote seventeen. So that that its impurity is more noticeable in comparison the pig, camel and the like, which have one mark of purity, but nevertheless also has in its innermost being an aspect of holiness in that it is sanctified as a firstborn, which is not the case with a pig or a camel. What the Torah says about this matter, sanctify me, Exodus 13.2, is very, very great. So are the souls of those in which only the scholar of Israel and not the aspect of free choice is revealed at the time of the approaching footsteps of the Messiah, and there is a cure for them, even though they are mel malodorous and saturated with heavy darkness. Of this Rav Yossef said, Let him, Messiah, come, and may I be worthy of sitting in the shadow of his donkey's dung. And it was Rav Yossef's manner to look at the inner aspect of everything. Rav Yossef attributed his greatness to the day the Torah was given, Psachim 68b, and said about his mother, I will arise before the approaching Shekhinah, the Divine Presence. The symbol for the Shekhinah or Knesset Israel in Kabbalah is Mother. See Shari Ora, Section 1, 
Brachot 35b and Ramban Genesis 24.1 I will arise before the approaching Shekhinah Divine Presence and said about himself, do not include when reciting this Mishnah the world, the world humility because there am I. Sota 49b, Rav Yosef is responding to the Mishnah when Rebbe died, humility and fear of sin ceased. In the text, though this, uh, in the letter, though this seems on the outside to be heaven forbid conceit, a person with a soul of segula like his, may he rest in peace. Certainly said, certainly said this with all the fullness of holiness and true humility, like the humility of the master of prophets, Moshe. May he rest in peace. For his, for his, Moshe's disciples follow in his ways. And because of this, it was so much the way of Moses to befriend those that were far from God that he befriended even the Erev Rav. Footnote, Rashi, Exodus 34.7 According to the Midrash, it was Moses who accepted and befriended the Erev Rav, Gentiles who sincerely converted to, Ju- to Judaism, and it was the Erev Rav who made the golden calf. See Shemot Rabbah 426 and although this caused the exile to last longer, in the end, even they will be spiritually uplifted, because surely the verse, may he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your counsel, to heal him 25, will be fulfilled for him as well, and the Lord, blessed be he, confirms the word of his servant and performs the counsel of his messengers, Isaiah 44.26. And it is said in the Zohar, in part 106a, that the loving kindness of Moshe, of Moshe was greater than that of Abraham. For Abraham, our father, even though his trait of loving kindness was very great, and he was not like Noah, who did not ask for mercy for the wicked in his generation, still prayed for God's mercy on storm, only on condition. Perhaps ten shall be found there. This is from Genesis 18.32. Abraham prayed that the wicked of Sodom be spared if ten righteous men could be found in the city. But Moses, may he rest in peace, asked without any conditions, If you will forgive their sin, their sin, and if not, blot me, I ask you, out of your book, which you have written, which is a sacrifice of his soul, even in the world to come, because the Lord's book in, is the world to come itself. That was from Exodus 32.32. 32. In regard to my writing that the praise of some of the transgressors had not detracted from my honour, for it is also said about Abraham, our father, may he rest in peace, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. This is from Genesis 18.18. And what you said in criticism, that the nations of the world did not think, heaven forbid, that Abraham, our father, was like them. Your honour must believe me. Most of those irreligious that like me also know and recognise that, heaven forbid, I am not one of them, nor of their splendour. Ezekiel 7.11 And as far as the east is from the west, so are my thoughts and ways far from the thoughts and ways, and they say so unhesitatingly. But they must also admit the truth that, thank God, my thinking is straight, and that I have no deceit in my heart or lips, and that, thank God, I am wholly full with the love of Israel. Blessed is God who has made my soul this way. It is not because of wisdom nor righteousness, but through the abundance of his compassion and loving kindness, which have neither end nor limit. But to this man will I look, to him that is poor and of contrite spirit, and and trembles at my word. Isaiah 66.2 And thank God, wherever it is needed, I speak out and protest against impurity. But I speak my words carefully and gently, as we are commanded by the wise king's advice. This is from a footnote. Rav Cook is referring to King Solomon's statement in, Cle- in Ecclesiastes, Kohelet 9.1. Words spoken softly by wise men are heeded sooner than those shouted by a lord in the manner of fools. And there is no doubt that if your honour and other great people of our time, may they live long, would strengthen my hand, accompany me and conduct themselves in my way to the extent that their characters allow it then the name of God would be sanctified, and much peace and blessing would be brought on Israel and the land of Israel. And many, a great many, would be fully returning to God, and the flourishing of the glorious salvation of the house of Israel would be revealed truly and speedily. 
It is completely impossible to, to imagine or describe the abundance of good and holiness and restoration of the world that would that would grow from it. And I am full of hope that it will be in, that it will indeed be so, with the help of God. And at long last, those who are God-fearing and those who know His name will turn to me and will realize the purity of my heart and the truth of my opinions. And all of us will unite to do the Lord's will, blessed be He, and to increase the light of God and His majesty on His nation and on the land of His desire and on all the ends of the earth. And concerning your taunt that I have become in my old age a Zionist, sacrificing my soul for the settlement of Jews in the land of Israel, my beloved friend. If all the Zionists would love the land of Israel and would want its resettlement with the same holy objective and intention that I have, since it is the land of the Lord which God has chosen and cherished from all the lands, the only land that has the segula, the unique qualities, the capacities of holiness that make possible prophecy, divine inspiration and the meriting of the world to come by simply walking there from Ketubot 111a. For its merit protects even the wicked, for it is said in the Talmud that even a Canaanite bondwoman who lives in the land of Israel is assured of a place in the world to come. And certainly the Talmud is not referring to a righteous bondwoman, for she would have a place in the world to come even without living in the Holy Land, since even pious Gentiles have a portion in the world to come, and all them also a bondwoman was obligated by the commandments. So surely the Talmud is referring to a common bondwoman, bondwoman of that time who was crude and wicked in both deed and character as is stated by the Shach. Uh, footnote Sifte Kohen on the Shulchan Aruch Yoredeah, Paragraph 1, Subsection 2. The Sifte Kohen commentary was written by Rav Shabte Kohen Shach in the 17th century. With regard to bondwoman and servants, and yet the merit of the land of Israel allows her to be assured of a place in the world to come. Jacob, our father, may he rest in peace, even feared wicked Asav, lest the merit of having dwelt in the land of Israel stand in his favour. How much more does this apply to holy seed, the children of those tested by God, the children of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, who are still called worthy children, even when they lack, lack faith, according to the opinion of Rav Meir, from Kiddushin 36a, whose opinion was accepted, as is said by the poet in Slichot, in both cases they are called sons, and in the response of Rashba, part 2, 194 and 242, if the sage is said to be lenient when there is doubt, when there is doubt in a case involving capital punishment, which concerns the life of the body, how much more is leniency called for in regard to matters of eternal life of the spirit? For the attribute of, attribute of loving kindness is much greater in eternal life. Anyone who strives to incline towards loving kindness and to champion Israel, even when they are not doing God's will, is praiseworthy, and how much more so when we take into account that one can find in each, in each and every, every individual, even in the weakest Jews, some precious pearls of good deeds and virtues that are beyond estimation. For surely the land of Israel helps them to be raised and sanctified. And if this cannot be seen openly in them, then it will be revealed in their children and children's children, as it is written, Let, let your deeds be seen by your servants, your glory by their children. To Tehillim 90.16 If all the Zionists would think in this way, it would certainly be a great glory for every great person in Israel, and for every Gaon and righteous person, to be such a Zionist, and even you need not be ashamed of such Zionism. Humbly yours, Avraham Ishak Hakohen Cook, Igrot 555.